One of the most important um, prophetic books in the Bible, I believe, um, is the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel speaks a lot about um, what happened in the past, the times that we are going through now, and then it speaks on the um, future events to come. So if you are ever stuck in a place where you think that the world has stopped and God has forgotten us, God has neglected us, just go to the book of Daniel and try and read it with the understanding and the illumination and inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And God will open up and reveal to you what he has shown Daniel in his visions, in the vision that he has showed King Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 2. He goes on to show Daniel visions in chapter 7 and 9 of what is to come of this world. And so where we find ourselves in here has been uh, where we find ourselves in the situation, world events, um, all the circumstances, everything that's taken place has been prophesied um, and shown to Daniel in visions by God. I'd like to start with an introduction to the book of Daniel. It's only fair that we understand the times that Daniel was in. Um, they were Israel were taken captive by Babylon. The Babylonian Empire invaded Jerusalem and um, conquered them, took the Israel boys and um, Israel men into slavery to work for the king. You will read in chapter 1, it says there, in the third year of the reign of Jochum, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, which was the king of Judah, into his hands, along with some of the articles of the temple. And these were carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasures of the house of, God, of his God. Then the king ordered Alphanas, uh, who was the chief of the court, to bring some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand and qualified to serve in the king's palace. So that was the criteria that went out. King Nebuchadnezzar sent out his captains, um, his chief officers, and they needed to go and look in, in the royal family of Israel um, for these type of men. He describes them because he wanted to teach them um, the language and the literature of the Babylonians. And then these men were all taken into um, captivity in the Babylon kingdom or empire. And among these men, the Bible tells us, or Daniel tells us, was Daniel himself and his three friends, which we obviously know, we're very familiar with them, Hananiah, Shadrach, um, Mishael, who is Meshach, and then Azariah, who is Abednego. So what happened in this time um, period, these young boys were taken in. If you understand or you read um, history, you will understand that these were boys were about 13, 14 years old because the king needed to groom them into his ways and into the Babylonian culture, um, raise them from a young age, but obviously they needed to show some um, maturity, some level of maturity, and they needed to have all these um, attributes that he describes from verse 4. And you continue to, to read that um, they were then offered some of these royal food and wine. So it was not this chief court official's um, you know, job description to make sure that they are, they are groomed, and then at the same time they need to be fed with royal uh, food and, and wine. And this was the type of foods that was described uh, prescribed to them. Now, what you need to understand about what happened here when Daniel refused to have this food, at the same time, he wanted to act, um, you know, very noble. He didn't want to offend the Babylonian king and what he's trying to do. But at the same time, these Hebrew boys, Jewish boys, um, were God-fearing boys. And they wanted to stick to their, ritu their rituals and their way of eating. So clearly the food that was presented to them at the time wasn't kosher at all. It hasn't been cooked a certain way or fried a certain way. And when it comes to the wine drinking, 
they had to pour out wine to um, certain rituals that, that the uh, Jewish men were accustomed to at the time. So the, Daniel and these three boys obviously had this discussion, you know, we cannot defile our bodies um, with food that is not kosher. Um, and so, you know, they spoke to the, to, to, to the chief official and he approached him and he said to him, well, look, um, you know, we cannot indulge in this type of food. It's against our culture as Jewish boys and we would like to, to just have some vegetables. If you continue to read, serve it to, to, to us for 10 days. Let's just have 10 days and then, you know, with water, we'll just, we'll just eat vegetables and we'll just drink water. And then you can compare our appearance to the other guys. I'm sure there were other Hebrew boys that was, you know, taken captive, but they clearly didn't have or see any problem with eating Babylonian prepared meat or Gentile prepared meat. Um, Daniel and the three brothers or the three boys stood up for what they believe in and what they feel God is, is instructing them to do and they just decided <clears throat> they're not going to indulge. All right. I think what the uh, servant was more concerned about here was the fact that, um, you know, if, if these boys were only allowed to eat fruit, uh, vegetable, vegetables and drink water, he was concerned about their appearance and I think for him it was a matter of, you know, he questioned them first of all and, you know, he was concerned about how they were going to look uh, in a few weeks time if, if they only eat vegetable, they needed their protein sources because they needed, be, needed to be well fed and well groomed in order to serve in the, in, in, in the um, kingdom of, the, of Babylon. And so he said, just put us to the test. Let's just put it to the test and let's just try. Verse 15, he comes and he says, at the end of the 10 days, they look healthier and they look better nourished than any of the other young men who ate the royal food, right? So the guard took away the choice foods and the wines that they drink and then he just gave them vegetables instead because he could see that they could just live on the vegetables, which obviously this was um, more of a, a spiritual thing than it was... Um, a physical thing because I believe that God has directed them and instructed them to approach the, the, this um, chief assistant of the king to have things done this way. Okay, so the, uh, you'll find then if you continue on to read verse 19, the king um, spoke to them and he found none equal to Daniel and to Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah. And um, so they entered into the king's service. Remember, they were in, in training for three years. If you back up in scripture, um, the king wanted them to be trained up, to be trained up to be these well-groomed men that could enter the king's service. And now he has come, the time has come, and the king met up with them, probably interviewed, had a chat with them, and he just found that um, in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them um, 10 times better than all the other magicians. So that was what he was training them up to be, magicians, magi. Um, you know, in the king's service were all these different men, um, enchanters, and there was astrologers, and he needed all the, the help of all these men to become a great and powerful king. He needed fortune tellers. He needed men at his service for every specific need that he had in terms of conquering the world, basically. I guess back in the, in the day, that was what every king's um, desire was to rule the world. Still is. But um, so Daniel remained in the services of the king. And you will find then um, he began to work for the king. The king appointed him. Um, you know, over all these, over all the magicians and the enchanters and all these guys, and he just grew. He just saw, he just found favor in the king's um, 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 presence, and it is, it just, it just speaks about every other man that God has raised in His Word. If you look at Joseph, if you look at Moses, Moses, you know, these were guys that that God. Tra uh, 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 trained up 
um, spiritually. These, are, these were men that God has selected to be able to come in front of Gentile kings and to be able to lead these Gentile kings without these Gentile kings knowing that um, you know these men were sent by God to be there. So if you understand when, when Israel was taken captive by this Babylonian king, and if you read the history of Israel, this was where God actually told them what was going to happen because of their disobedience. They will be taken out of the land of Israel. The land will be desolate. Um, Israel will not have full control and full reign over, over their land. The Jewish people were removed. They were taken into captive. And if, if you just go into, a, into history a little bit, um, back up, you will find that the kingdom of Judah and the kingdom of Israel was split and you know these people were taken out of the land of Israel and why was that just a little bit of history you know they were supposed to keep the um, every seventh year was supposed to be a seventh year a year of rest for the land okay as much as the Israelites were supposed to rest on the seventh day God gave them instructions or a command to rest the seventh year. The, the earth and the land of Israel, Jerusalem, needed to rest as well. But as time went on, Israelites became greedy. They, you know, went against what God told them to do. And because of that, for the amount of years that Israel has, um, you know, worked the lands on, on, on the seventh year, for that amount of years, they were taken out of Israel. They were taken captive by all these Babylonian kings and Assyrian kings. And you'll find that they, um, the land needed to rest. So Israel was in ruins. Israel was, um, you know, the land was just desolate. And, you know, they've, they've, they've removed all the people from there. But this was everything that God um, warned Israel about. What was going to happen to the land of Jerusalem if they don't obey and give the land its seventh year to rest? God obviously made provision for them in the sixth year. They could plant and harvest, sow and harvest enough that will cover for the seventh year. And that sounds very familiar if you think about it. Where have you heard that story before? If you go back to the manna in the desert, in the wilderness, God said to them every day they can collect the amount of manna that they will need for the day the amount of nourishment, the amount of food that they will need for the day. And then they didn't have to keep any, any leftovers for the following day. But when it comes to the sixth day, God actually instructed them that they can take enough manna to, to, to um, carry them through the seventh day. Because on the seventh day, which is their Sabbath day, they needed to rest. And they need not go out and... Um, go and collect the men and the amount of food and go and work the crowns so or whatever it is that they needed to do. So once they were into the promised land, that still stood that they had their seventh rest, their seven day rest. However, then God instructed them that the land needed to rest on the seven days. We will learn more about that when we go into chapter two rather chapter 7, and we will find why that was so important for them to allow the land to rest and why they are being persecuted for not allowing the land to rest. So that is just the introduction when it comes to the book of Daniel. I will, I, I will tackle the rest of the chapters in due time, but I hope this will just give you a brief understanding of um, how Daniel got into Babylon and how he became one of the uh, chief officials or overseer of all the Magi. And that, is, that was his work. He was a prophet, a prophet that God set out to use. And at the same time, a prophet that this Gentile king could use. You will find that in the, in the Bible, a lot of Gentile kings reach out to Jewish men for uh, interpretations of their dreams and their visions. They get stuck with a, with a certain, um, you know, trial or test. And then Joshua would come and Joshua would give the uh, Pharaoh, you know, a plan of action. This is what we have to do. You know, if you're going to have your seven years of, of um, uh, drought and whatnot, we need to take these steps and those steps. And, you know, God would use these uh, Hebrew men then 
that he would send out into the world. And this is one of one of the way God institution, instituted missionary work. Because Israel was the chosen people and God revealed himself to Israel, he would then use these Israelites, like he did with Daniel, in the land of Babylon, in, in a Gentile land. And um, there's a lot that we will uncover in the coming chapters to show where um, God has actually begin to begin to minister to Gentiles um, when we continue to read. But for now, that was the introduction, and I hope that you will tune in again when we get to chapter 2.